Thank you very much. Um, just to say, my name is Shayi Akiwowo, um, and I'm the founder and executive director of Glitch. And we're all about making the online space safe for all. And that is through delivering workshops, resources, and training to those who are online at the moment so they can be, be safe and be able to navigate the online space safe as well as looking at long-term systematic change. So what the role of government and tech companies can play. So I'm super pleased that we're having a conversation about the long awaited online harms bill. Um, I think the first thing to talk about is what do we mean by online abuse? So for us at Glitch, online abuse is a catch all term that talks about different um, experiences, tactics um, from stalking, harassment, dead naming, hate speech, doxing um, to, the sharing of non-consensual photography and then new forms of online abuse that we are seeing thanks to the growth of technology um, and new platforms like deep fakes and um, the image-based abuse. And I think when we're talking about online abuse and harms and the, if there's one key takeaway I can, get, take, I can pass on from this point is that we have to see online harms from an intersectional lens. We have to understand that many different people experience online abuse in a different way. And if we only look at the abuse that uh, certain groups, certain privileged groups, certain majority groups experience online abuse, then this bill will fall short of protecting people online and will only continue to perpetuate the same kinds of abuse that we are seeing not being tackled. I think the second thing I'd like to highlight um, in my seven minutes is the importance of um, um, the, of COVID-19 and, and how online um, abuse has increased during lockdown. Um, Ofcom has told us in many quarterly reports that online usage has massively increased, which in some ways is great because it means that we are connecting, we are, we are tackling isolation, we are uh, able to use the internet in the, in the amazing ways that we have been doing, but there is a real concern that that means that online abuse will increase. And we did sadly see that last year. Our ripple effect report, which we did, in, co in collaboration with End Violence Against Women Coalition. And thanks to colleagues at home, Hope Not Hate, for your amazing support and statement on that report, showed that online abuse had increased for women and non-binary people. And that when you look at that, when you look at it through a, a racial lens, this increased to 50%. Um, also on the backdrop of this is obviously women being furloughed, women in precarious unemployment and so forth. And so there's a real concern around the role that employers now play when it comes to online abuse and how they can support um, freelancers, zero hour contract staff, journalists, women in public life so that they are able to carry out their role uh, safely and confidently. But sadly, if we're going to continue having lockdown measures, which we obviously need, we have to we need to understand what it can be put in place right now to protect people. And the one thing that we're calling for um, outside the online harms bill, but can obviously be included, is is a just is a percentage of the digital services tax, which has generated something like four hundred million pounds, to be ring fenced towards ending online abuse. So that should look at things around enforcement. That should look at things around education, and that should look at, at things around a public health approach to our online space. Because actually, if there's anything that I've learned from last year, <laughs> there's many things. It's from Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd, and that made us all take a moment to reflect on um, what does punitive action actually li lead to? Our, our, our justice reform, how does that actually lead to any, any kind of systemic change? And I think if there's one thing for us to reflect on is how, as much as I find trolls very much annoying online, how much will sending them to prison for two months, three months, six months, or a suspended sentence actually make our online spaces safer? And actually, how can we start looking at a public health approach to quite a lot of these harms? Because when you unpick quite a lot of the people that are doing trolling, when I've spoken to Instagram yummy mummies who are being trolled by their colleagues who are using anonymous accounts. A lot of this is being driven by isolation, by depression and mental health. So I really would like to see money being ring fenced um, that is being generated from these platforms to look at tackling some of these um, issues from a public health approach. But then finally, what do we want to see um, from the online harms bills, our online harm bill? I think there are three things. Firstly, education. Uh, we need to see more than just media literacy. It's not enough ensuring that young people know how to work the Sky Remote and how to do PowerPoint slides. We need to get, we need to make sure that young people know how to be critical thinkers and engage in content online in a safe way. We need to ensure that um, all people know how to report um, um, abuse, abuse to the platform and also escalate to law enforcement. 
We also need to understand what our responsibility is. And that is going to take a real culture change, a real forming of social norms, which I think compassion in politics is a really good framework to help us understand what that social norm can be. So what does it look like when you quote, tweet, quote, tweet people? How does it look like when you've in, maybe indirectly posted a photo or a selfie with somebody without permission? How do we start having conversations around things that are not illegal, but are definitely harmful and building a culture, a good culture online and understanding that as digital citizens, we both have rights and responsibilities. I think the second thing we want to make sure, and I understand, I understand that the terminology may not sit with everybody, but we need to think about making sure that the form of online harms that we talk about doesn't just look at children and doesn't just look at cybercrime or just doesn't look at women from a very sexualized point of view. We need to understand that women experience all forms of online abuse, particularly women of color and, other th and, and those with multiple insects and identities. It was a real shame that in the proposed bill of the online harms, and I, I'm glad that there's been growth since then, but there's still way to, way to go, that the only examples mentioned about women's abuse was around Jess Phillips being um, a joke, to, there being a joke around Jess Phillips being raped. There is so much more to women's experience of online abuse than just sexual assault and harassment. And we have to make sure that it is inclusive of that. And then the very last thing I would say is a duty of care that we put on tech companies from the very inception of design of, of the platform of new products. We saw it recently with the rollout of um, audio on Twitter and there was no thinking about how this would alienate our disabled communities and friends and how this would then cause more abuse for women and we already saw within 20 minutes of the platform being rolled out to certain iPhone Apple users that women were experiencing um, online abuse and harassment so we really need to be thinking about from the very inception of products um, being designed that it's there with a safety safety by design principle which also means that then we need to call on tech companies to be a lot more diverse than they currently are. But I'm really looking forward to answering your questions and hoping that you can champion your recommendations around the online harms bill. Thank you very much.